Good morning, everyone. Chaplain, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Friends are very important to me, and I have a good feeling that after this morning's chapel, I'll have a lot of new friends. Two of my friends are here already with us. That's Patrick and Mike. I wonder if Patrick and Mike can stand if you're in the room and say hello right in the back, guys. Uh, that wonderful to see you guys too, yeah. Uh, I want to tell you this morning why my hair is on fire. And uh, it's a good thing to have your hair on fire in this talk. I remember as a college student, my own inner doubts that I experienced during college, uh, I felt like maybe I was a uh, pretender, great pretender, not living up to what I was saying in my words. I confess that uh, the demons were trying to tell me I was not qualified for Christian service. Hey, maybe you're like me. Thank you for leading us in a confession. I need to confess my sins, but I want to say, if you're burdened by doubts and feelings of condemnation, hear me say, don't despair. Don't despair on account of what anyone might have done. Uh, let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your invitation to sinners to come home. Your love is so great. Enable these Christians, the students and faculty at Wheaton College, to do God's will that all of us might complete the work on earth you are giving us to do, and thus glorify and magnify God's name among all the peoples of the world. Amen. Hey, my friend Mike, he's in the back. His hair is on fire too, because Mike is a missionary kid. And uh, I hope we have some missionary kids at the chapel this morning. Yeah. Third culture, third culture kids are great. Missionary kids are wonderful. And I'd like to meet you after chapel if you're a missionary kid, okay? I got three missionary kids. And uh, they, they were born in uh, the United States but grew up in northern Iraq among the Kurds. The Kurds who say they live between Iraq and a hard place. Ha ha. Yeah. My wife says, my wife says Iraq is a great place to raise a family. Maybe that's why we're still in therapy. Look at our amazing planet, seen here as a blurry blue dot hurtling across the universe. But on closer examination, we look with alarm. One becomes aware that our planet is tearing itself apart. It looks like a baseball torn along the stitches, especially torn along racial and religious lines. This should not be, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Great reconciliation has begun in Jesus Christ. We have some early victories. In the person of Christ, a bright, hopeful dawning portends a better future until one day, one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And how long is that? Already this future reconciliation has begun. This is what mission is all about. There are many more to come. In this history's 11th hour, we live in hope as Christians, believing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And if you can think of anything more exciting than that, you'll have to tell me because I can't. No wonder C.T. Studd said, if God calls me to be a missionary, I would not stoop to be a king. There is an awesome reconciling power that has been set in motion. The person behind that power is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is known as Aslan in the great Narnia Chronicles. We are going through the wardrobe, my friend, through all the wardrobes. Next stop, Narnia, where it's always winter and never Christmas. You do believe in Narnia, don't you? Just checking. We say to the witch, she has been defeated. The risen Aslan has leaped inside the courtyard wall to restore the great multitude of creatures that the witch turned into, you remember, turned into statues. And what Aslan is doing to restore their humanity? <sighs> he breathes on them. That is what is happening. 
Life is being restored to Muslims who were imprisoned in the castle courtyard of Islam. Here is one Muslim man whom Aslan set free. He began to read the Bible as the leader of the mosque. He came to know Jesus Christ and bowed the knee. And this is a picture of him after they beat him up in the prison to try and beat it out of him. Look at the joy of the Lord on this man. He's been set free from the courtyards of the queen, which by Aslan. I know of hundreds more courtyards in the Narnias of the world. The final frontiers are becoming clear. I can help you find them. I can help you get beyond the places where any mission effort has begun yet in the Muslim world. Our mission, with love and respect, inviting all Muslim peoples to follow Jesus. We sometimes say missionaries to Muslims are one in a million. Yeah, it's that inadequate. But I can show you cities with millions of Muslim people in them where there is no witness at all, where there are no pushpins in anybody's missionary maps. As Tim said, we have more than 200 teams making a change, healing the world by setting up house in the Muslim cities of the world, moving into neighborhoods. But let me tell you, another 200 teams going farther to the final frontiers would make a colossal difference. And you can go with your friends, form new teams based upon the people that you know. Three decades ago, our founder, Greg Livingstone, an alumni of here of Wheaton College, brooded as he walked along the beach, Lord, why another mission agency? There are already so many good ones. But there was none whose total mission was to Islam. All Muslims, only Muslims, and so a movement was born. Today, more than a thousand missionaries live in Muslim neighborhoods of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. But it's too soon to quit. Too soon to celebrate. A great healing of our planet must yet take place. It has already begun, but the present day is a prelude to the peace of Christ and the reconciliation of the peoples of the world, which will happen in the end of history. I believe the greatest healing in the world for reconciliation with God is going to happen in the Muslim world. More about that tomorrow morning. Take a look at this map. This map of the Muslim world is dotted with stars representing churches by God's grace planted by Frontiers teams, elders appointed from a Muslim background. But in recent years, we have seen an acceleration of the number of churches being planted in the Muslim populations of the world. Our faith has increased as God has blessed us. Now we do not think only of planting a church here and there, but of catalyzing disciple making movements among Muslims. There is so much more happening today than ever before in some places. For this we praise God. But carefully look and you will see that many large areas of the Muslim world are still without the light of the gospel. I can tell you where those places are. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached through the whole world as a testimony to the ethne, the nations, and then the end shall come. This is the only place in the Bible these six words are used. And then the end shall come. God is most glorified when we are most enabled by Jesus Christ to complete the work he gave us to do on earth. And he has revealed what that work is. I would propose to you that of all the important tasks God has given to the people of God, there is one most urgent as revealed by Christ. Now that we are in the 11th hour of history and at this 11th hour before the end, what is going to happen in the world? I'm gonna make a prediction and you're gonna be able to tell your friends that you heard it here first, so get ready to text them. You're gonna be famous in about five minutes. What's about to happen in the history of the world? I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm from a nonprofit organization. <laughs> What's about to happen in the history of the world? Unexpected things. There, you heard it here first. <laughs> but these unexpected things happen through the one who said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, you will make disciples because unexpected things are about to happen in the world. That is the way we lived among the Kurds. That is the legacy Jesus Christ gives to his missionaries today. There is a hymn about the great purposes of Christ. A great hymn that's a hundred years old. It's called God is Working His Purpose Out. This is how it goes. It goes like this. 
God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. God is working his purpose out and the time is drawing near. Nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that will surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. From utmost east to utmost west, where e'er man's foot hath trod, by the mouth of many messengers goes forth the voice of God. Give ear to me, you continents, ye islands, give ear to me, that the earth may be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. What must we do to work God's work, to prosper and increase the kingdom of God in the day of the Lord and bring in the age of peace? What must we do to hasten the day, the day that will surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God? as the waters. You've got to, you've got to believe in this great finality. I mean, Revelations chapter 22, happily ever after, reconciliation of all things under the Lordship of Christ, and that this great happily ever after denouement of history is connected ineluctably. Pastor, I've always wanted to use that word in public is connected inextricably to the plans and his purposes for his people. Blessed to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Blessed to be a, this great cadence, this great golden thread which binds together all the 66 books of the Bible into one unified story that God wants his people back. And he's going to use us. Near the end of his life, Jesus said, I have glorified thee on earth, having completed the work you gave me to do. John 17, 4. May God be glorified on earth as we ask him, Lord, what is the work you gave us to do? Some of you have many decades left. Some of us have little time. The question is the same. How may we do the God glorifying work of missions on earth? However, however, not all of missions overseas is of the same strategic importance. The most strategic mission is to press ahead to the final frontiers. The last courtyards where Aslan has yet to leap the walls. Completing the task of, of beginning a church planting movement among the remaining about 1,100 or so unengaged Muslim people groups. Completing this task, the task of engaging all Muslim peoples with the gospel. This is the problem, the small part of the Great Commission that Frontiers is trying to address and trying to solve. Where there are no pushpins in anybody's missionary maps. I wanted to go to begin a new work. God heard my desire, and so we were privileged to raise our family among the Kurds. There were no Iraqi believers when we arrived, no Bible, no baptisms. We felt entirely weak and inadequate. But my friends, look at this. This is the Gospel of John in the Kurdish language, the first book of the Bible translated into the language of the Kurds where we lived, the work of the first believers. I'd like to read to you from the Gospel of John in the Kurdish language. Imagine if you were hearing the Word of God for the first time in your own language. That would sound like this. Mizginya Yohanna, Pisket Dahe, Charda Hatta Shalzda. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 14 to 16. Isaiah Gut, as Shivani Basham, Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. And I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And then this. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They too shall hear my voice. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. 
Did you hear the word of the Lord? Jesus said, I have, I have, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. They must hear my voice. Do you want to know where history is going? Jesus has revealed the future with be, be the utter completion of the missionary task. I believe this co completion could happen soon and that we are here today. We who are here today can prayerfully say that may God glorify us by hastening that day. Students at Wheaton, the final frontiers await you. Your fathers went to the moon, but that was so yesterday. They saved the galaxies for you, for now. They saved the most for you. Your fathers barely left the gravity of planet Earth. You can sail to the stars. You can walk on the Milky Way. There are still places where the pioneers can be the first. You can make it your ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. Look back in history. The former frontiers of Christianity are today's Christian heartlands. Yesterday's lonely Christian outposts are today's traffic jams in church parking lots. In America, get this, there are 23 churches for every McDonald's restaurant. And if we all work together, we can make it 24 in our lifetime. Or not. I know we have to take back the darkness of Chicago and the United States, but I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for the unengaged peoples who are not near any Christians, where your single candle, your team's candles will make so much difference in the darkness. At this late hour of history, what should we pray? John Piper said, prayer was meant to be a wartime walkie-talkie by which we get our orders to move out, but we have made it into a hotel intercom by which we ring up for room service. You were not made to pray for room service. Let's pray that laborers would be sent. Let's pray that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray that we might glorify the Father by completing the work he has given us to do. I'm telling you, I know where the final frontiers are. I can help you get there. And if you can think of anything more exciting than that, you'll have to tell me. Tell your classmates to give up smaller ambitions and to preach the gospel of Christ where the needs are so great. Friends, on some future day, the mission to make disciples of all nations will be complete. I am excited about completing that task in our day. That's why my hair is on fire. We've handed out a lot of half sheets. We ran out of half sheets. I'd like to connect with you. If, if you'd like to connect with me, please write down your name, email address, hand it in to Patrick and Mike at the end or myself, and uh, we can talk further. I'll hand out some more half sheets tomorrow because we ran out. We have some early victories. Our victory that I can share with you is in a mu Muslim country of the Middle East. Frontiers team leader, let's call them Ike and Tina, have trained dis leaders to start discovery Bible studies among Muslims. And in this way, Ike and Tina have catalyzed a disciple-making movement. Here's a graph. Note that on the graph, we see at the bottom, the, we see uh, towards the bottom the ethnic groups that they're involved with, the language of the Kurds, the language of the Turks, the language of the Arabs, three different language groups. A year ago right now in January, there were seven gathered groups among the Kurds. That's pretty astonishing. One among the Turks and six among the Arabs. But look at this, by May of last year when I visited them, 28, 7, and 21. But by August, there were more than 100 gathered groups, groups of people studying the Word of God together, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, many of them as families, the oikos movements of the New Testament being replicated in our day. This is good news, but it had a costly discipleship. For here's what happened next. I received an email recently. It is with a heavy heart that I let you know that about, about a martyrdom in one of our Middle Eastern countries with a network of over 100 groups. I invite you to join in interceding for these precious brothers and sisters and for the vitality of their witness. We have had some early victories, costly victories. Paul wrote, there is a wide open door for effective service and also many adversaries. What if completing the task were to be made our top priority? Let's change what if into what is. Let's engage the hundreds of Muslim peoples because the needs are the greatest where the people walk in darkness. Engagement is costly. By engaging them, we mean a hard and bitter dedication to isolation and loneliness from all that is familiar, but with a team whom you can go with into ministry. Residents among Muslims in their homeland, setting up homes, learning language and culture for a long time, and planning on planting churches and catalyzing disciple-making movements. 
More about that tomorrow. May God increase your faith and may you be enabled to give up smaller ambitions and preach the gospel in this history's 11th hour and final hour where the needs are so great. Thank you very much.